Good morning, everybody. Um, so this is how it's going to work. I'm going to say a few words just about our topic. I'll introduce our panel. And like yesterday, if you were here, when we're finished, we'll open up the mic uh, to the room. Uh, like Ted said yesterday, you know, a lot of these things, uh, we don't want to force you into asking questions if you actually have something to say yourself. So, you know, we can't do a go around in a, in a room this large, but, you know, it's our way to do a go around of the willing, uh, so to speak. So, um, you know, if you do make remarks, like we're going to try and keep our remarks to about five to eight minutes or so. Um, and if you can keep yours brief, too, just, you know, so other people have a chance to talk as well. Because um, we know there's a lot of experience in the crowd, not just up here on the, uh, on the podium. So uh, first I'm going to introduce who's with us. Uh, first we have uh, Mike Calderon. Mike's the principal of Warren G. Harding uh, Middle School in Philadelphia in the Frankfurt section. Uh, we have Joe Roy, who's the superintendent of the Bethlehem Area School District, uh, the school district where we are right now. Uh, Harrison Bailey. Uh, Harrison is the principal of Liberty High School, uh, one of the two big high schools in Bethlehem. We also have Mike Laporta. Mike's the principal of Freedom High School, also in Bethlehem. And then on the end, we have Sue Boshin, who's the principal of Deeriff High School in Allentown. Uh, that is the neighboring major city to Bethlehem. If you look at uh, this area from uh, an aerial view, it basically looks like one big me metropolis. And it's Allentown, Easton, and Bethlehem. It's basically a, an ur urban areas that have grown together. Um, so we'll, they'll have a chance to talk from their own perspective about restorative practices in their schools. So the, you know, when we thought about what to do for this session, I mean, we've been at restorative practices in schools now for the better part of a decade and a half. Uh, if you count what we did in our own programs, I guess we, you could say from since 1977. Until now, we've really focused on uh, it, venues like this, selling people on the idea and trying to build the consciousness that the belief that restorative practices can actually work, that it can be effective. I really think, I mean, there's still people out there, but I think they're mostly not in this room that still need to be convinced of that. Uh, um, so I'm going to assume for the vast majority of you, you know, you've accepted the idea that restorative practice is effective. It can work. But I think one of the critical factors is having things that work is only the beginning of, you know, the battle when you think about changing systems. There's lots of good ideas that never get used. There's lots of good ideas that never get fully implemented or don't get implemented well or with fidelity. Uh, so I think the challenge we're facing now is looking at how do you take restorative practices to scale? Um, you know, one of the, I had a conversation with a CEO of a major school district in the U.S. that I know from many years ago. And we were talking and we said, you know, 10 years ago we were these little tiny voices crying in the wilderness of zero tolerance, you know? Uh, saying, no, there's another way, we swear. Um, um, it'll work, trust us, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, we, we basically, basically spent the last 10 years proving that, yeah, it does work. But now, uh, like she and I were talking about, you know, now those people who were seeking an alternative to policies that we know have failed, that were seeking an alternative to policies that we know have funneled children into the criminal justice system, have harmed particularly minority youth, and their families for generations. Um, if you're database, it's undeniable that those things have failed. And those people that were working on the alternatives and working against those practices have now risen up in the ranks. I mean, this woman, I know her from when she was middle level administration in a large city. Now she runs the school district in a major city in the US. And she said, the funny thing was, she said, yeah, now we're in charge. I hope we don't screw it up, <laughs> you know? But we have the opportunity. I mean, I think in some ways, it's still, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but I think the torch is kind of passing to us, and that's everyone in the room, that it's our time. We do have a window to make serious, systemic, substantial change, you know? Not every project is gonna last. Uh, we have to be honest about what's working and what's not working, if this is to be more than just a flash in the pan. Uh, I think what a lot of us have, ho have hoped for a long time is that, you know, like when the, um, the current structure, of the pub especially the public education system, was founded, that we'll have a chance to reset the baseline of what's normal in education and what's considered standard practice. Uh, and that's going to take some time, but it's also going to take a lot of work on our part. It, it is up to us to prove that it can be done and it can work in the system that exists, not in some fantasy utopia of restorative vision of the future. We have to work with the reality as it is right now. So some of the things that we're doing, uh, and people here represent some of the projects that are some of the biggest projects in the US and in the world that are happening with restorative practices in schools. Um, in the last few months, we received a very large grant in the city of Philadelphia to implement our whole school change program in 10 Philadelphia secondary schools. 
Uh, so these are all schools who are largely, they're called receiving schools, who have been receiving students from the 30 so or so schools in Philly that have been shut down due to budget problems. So that means schools that were already have a lot of challenges now accepting sometimes 50 to 80 to 100% more students than they did before, mixing neighborhoods of students who don't typically mix, which is a huge challenge for safety and culture and a lot of other reasons. Um, so they're, but they're seeing and hoping that restorative practice, it's not gonna deal with all of the challenges and issues like staff being cut, staff being slashed, uh, losing a lot of support staff, but hopefully, um, you know, it's one way to say, even in an environment where there's a lot of stressors, um, it certainly, you know, it certainly could give schools the ability to deal with the relationship, community, connection issues, and to help people deal with those challenges as a community, um, you know, and do it together. So, Mike can talk a little bit about that. In the Lehigh Valley area, uh, if we look at, we're implementing our program in uh, both Bethlehem high schools, uh, Liberty and Freedom in both Allentown High Schools, Allen and Deerif. Between those four high schools total, that's, it touches over 10,000 students in the Lehigh Valley area. So the potential impact of that could be huge. Um, you know, if you look at how many children won't enter the juvenile justice system, if you look at how many times police won't be called uh, to the school districts, and I was speaking with someone yesterday about um, uh, what I think is the next wave of reform, and I think we can also make a really good alliance between being fiscally conservative. Restorative practices is a lot cheaper than authoritarian control measures in schools. If you look at the cost of contracts, I mean, if you could just go onto public bid websites for cities, look at what surveillance cameras, barbed wire, metal detectors, and security personnel cost versus a two-year whole school change program, you know, at the high end, maybe, I don't know, Seventy, eighty thousand dollars for two years—it's um, a pittance compared to what's been spent on things that we know don't work. Um, so I think you could see an alliance between that, but also then between people who see community connection, relationship, empowering the individual, empowering families to take care of their own problems. If you can bring those two groups together, particularly in the U.S., I think you'd have a pretty unstoppable force for reform because it would cut across traditional political lines too. So that's my speech. But um, so, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Mike Calderon from Harding Middle School in Philadelphia. Thank you, John. Uh, as John said, my name is Mike Calderon. I'm the proud principal of the Warren G. Harding Middle School, which is located in the Frankfurt section of Philadelphia. I'm uh, currently in, we're in our second year of school wide implementation of restorative practices. And I have to say, so far, so good. Uh, I was able to see immediate results last year in just the first year of implementation. Uh, we saw uh, 66 fewer out-of-school suspensions. Um, we saw our violent incidents decrease by roughly 20%. And I know that a lot of that is due um, in great part to the work around restorative practices that we've done. I want to give you a little background on my school. Um, as John said, we are considered a receiving school. Um, um, a middle school from another neighborhood closed. So we went from having 600 students last year to 925 this year um, while losing staff. Um, so that, that's kind of been one of the challenges we're facing this year. Um, but we, we brought restorative practices to Harding uh, a year ago. Uh, I was very fortunate to, um, I was provided with a grant uh, that we were, I was given discretion to use for something around changing climate and culture in our school. Uh, we were considered, um, there was 46 schools in the city considered focus 46 schools. And that meant that we were either um, labeled by the state as a persistently dangerous school or we fed uh, a persistently dangerous school. So after my first year, we were able to get ourselves off of the persistently dangerous school list. However, our, the school that we fed uh, was still, still there. So I basically threw it out to my staff. You know, we have this money. Here's five or six different programs. Look through them um, and, and come up with the one that you think would work best here. And in the back of my mind, I really wanted restorative practices, but uh, and I. I, I did my part to kind of stack the deck a little bit. <laughs> but um, 
They did, I mean, it, the study I used to sell them on was West Philadelphia High School and I believe 2006. So I was like, look, it can work in Philly. So why don't we give it a shot? And that, I think, led to a great deal of the success we had was having the buy-in from the teachers because they had some say in, in, in the choice of the program. Um, there was some pushback. Uh, a couple staff, there was like two of my like 90 staff members that weren't really on board at first. Um, so there was some pushback, this is soft. Um, you know, how can you just sit in a circle and talk about your feelings and then that somehow makes everything okay. So I, I kept telling people, well, you know, if arresting people and suspending people would lead to um, high student achievement rates and no issues in our school, then we would have been flawless two, three years ago. <laughs> and clearly we were not. So, um, it, you know, positive intervention behavior systems can only go so far. Uh, we, did have, we do have a very strong PBIS system in our school, but we needed something else. Something that kind of brought it all together and showed students and staff alike what it's like to be part of a community and how your actions have ripple effects throughout. Um, again, th there was pushback. It was kind of minor. The, the new challenge that we're running into now is with my staff, um, because we're receiving school, we're receiving all these new students, they have no idea what restorative practices are. Um, so our big challenge this year is bringing all of these new staff members on board um, who didn't necessarily have an option. I mean, when we interviewed, we, we told them restorative practices is the heart of what we do here. And if you're not okay with that, then this probably isn't the job for you. And also our students, they came from another school that had some concerns of, of its own. They had some problems with continuity of leadership in the building. So their expectations of what school was like is very different from what ours was at Harding. So trying to get them on board has been, you know, a challenge thus far this year. It seems like in the last couple of weeks, it's finally taken hold that they understand the students now, the new students, what restorative practices are, why we use them. In fact, we use circles in the very beginning of the year to start building these bridges between the two school communities with, I mean, we use them even with the staff. So every time we have a staff meeting, we all sit in a circle. The teachers don't like that because it's hard to write with the paper on your lap or your laptop on your lap. So, <clears throat> but we try to really model that in everything that we do. Um, and <coughs> the biggest challenge for me, um, if you can tell, I don't necessarily look like the most warm and fuzzy person in the world. <laughs> um, and I came from a, a disciplinary background before I became an administrator. So I was used to that whole, you know, law and order, kind of I'm laying down the law and you're going to pick it up when I throw it down. And it was really a, a, a challenge to my whole mindset. While I knew that this was good, I still regress back to my old habits. And I had to, um, to challenge myself. It was literally, full disclosure, we had a, a staff circle. And I basically made my counselor cry and because she's like we're trying to do this and then you know when something happens in the hallway you're just blasting the kids you know you're yelling that's not restorative and I was like you know what you're absolutely right and from that moment on it's the warmer fuzzier Mr. C <laughs> and and I have to make myself I, I really do I, I actually hung the restorative question poster behind my chairs so that when I'm talking to the kids, I make sure I'm following them. Uh, for you to see. For me to see, yeah. Um, because I want to make sure that, you know, as the leader, that I'm modeling this all the times as well, that I'm expecting my teachers to. And I've seen a change. I mean, in fact, some of the staff are even saying the same thing to my assistant principal, like, wow, you guys are like nice now. Uh, <laughs> And I said, it's not that we weren't nice, it was just we were in that old school mentality. And that's a big change. And I think it's important that as administrators, you acknowledge that, that this isn't how the business of school has been done for the last 100 years. You're doing 
you know, it's the whole doing discipline to, not with. So <clears throat> we've seen a lot of positive changes around that. There's nobody screaming at the kids in the hallways. Um, the kids now are taking ownership. And so if something happens at lunch, you, know, you hear them coming up the stairs, like, we need to circle up about this. Um, and that's when I knew that it was really taking hold. When the kids are saying those types of things and, and requesting circles on their own, that's how I know that we're making real progress. And we continue to, to work towards that. I mean, there's certainly some classes are better than others because their teachers just have more experience with the circles. Like I said, about 25 of my teachers are new and had no formal training. We did all the trainings last year. And due to some budgetary issues that you may have heard of in the school district, it's tough to pay people um, to come in on a Saturday because we don't have any money. So that's, that's been a challenge as well. <clears throat> but um, I, uh, I anticipate more great things uh, coming out of our implementation of restorative practices this year. I was going to say, I was feeling the warmth, I was feeling, so it was good. So good morning, I'm Joe Roy, I'm the superintendent of the Bethlehem Area School District. And uh, first of all, welcome to Bethlehem, uh, for those of you who came out of the area. Um, the casino is open, but if you really feel compelled to give away your money, Harrison, Mike and I are happy to accept it on behalf of the school district, just directly to us. <clears throat> I'm going to jump back uh, to 1998 and then fast forward forward. In 1998, I was a high school principal uh, in a small high school, mostly rural, rural, suburban, um, not far from here, about 25 minutes from here. And we were implementing a new school within a school, interdisciplinary, hands-on program for about 150 students who were really alienated from school. And the teachers had worked incredibly hard to create this new program. We had a wing of the building dedicated. We had a new, they devised an entirely new curriculum. And they were really doing everything possible to individualize instruction, literally going student by student every day, planning what do they need to do? What does this person need to do? And <clears throat> we had all the structures in place. But we, what we had, what I came to realize we had overlooked was the, that cultural relationship piece. And we kind of assumed that if the teachers were excited and doing things differently for the kids, the kids' behaviors would just change and they would be excited too. That didn't happen. These were 10th graders in the program, so their habits of not being into school, being alienated, being a pain in the butt, they had, cult, they had developed those over 10 years. And they didn't change suddenly because the teachers were doing things differently. And as a result, the teachers were incredibly frustrated. Um, because we're doing it, we're killing ourselves, and we're still having the same behaviors. And of course, I had talked the teachers into doing this program, and so I had a near mutiny on my hands. And luckily for me, and by sheer coincidence, Ted and Susan Wachtel were parents of a student at Palisades High School, and we fall into a conversation. They're interested in seeing how might these restorative practices, things we're doing at our alternative schools apply to public schools, and so I was like, hey, I, gotta, I have something for you. Come on in. And so they began to work with that team of teachers. It was the first, this is before there were any trainings, before there was any IIRP or Safer Saner Schools or anything. Um, and we began to work with those teachers. And, and we saw very quickly changes in the students' behaviors when they were, things were done with them and they were involved and they were starting to solve problems together. It's pretty dramatic. So I was like, this, there might be some, uh, some value in this. And so we expanded it at that small high school. And from there, I went to another high school and, and similarly implemented restorative practices. And at those small schools, we used what I call the concentric circles approach to implementation. We took a small group of teachers, took the willing, trained them. Next year, next semester, trained a larger group, trained another group. And in a small school, over a relatively short period of time, we could train, the, train up the whole school. Uh, and we saw significant changes. So that kind of the concentric circles building outward from the inner circle. When I came to Bethlehem as a superintendent, now I come to a district that's the sixth largest district in the state, 
Uh, we have 22 schools, 14,000 students, but we focus on our two large high schools, Liberty and Freedom. Freedom has about 3,000, I'm sorry, Liberty has 3,000 students, uh, Freedom has about 2,000 students. We're talking about 5,000 high school students. So the question became then, how do we implement restorative practices in these two huge organizations? Um, and high schools are difficult places to change anyway. Um, and so, and, and some of the things we ran into when I came, when I came to Bethlehem, um, we had a, a truly, we were, we were in the punitive mode. We were in the punitive box on the social discipline window. Um, I, I never heard so much talk in a school district about the code of conduct, the code of conduct, the code of conduct. Every school district has a code of conduct, but we were obsessed with our code of conduct. And we were obsessed with only that portion of the code of conduct that dealt with consequences. Everyone had forgotten about, it's actually a good document, the beginning, the first half of the code of conduct talks about universal values, student responsibilities, all the great things we want to pay attention to was not part of our conversation at all. Um, the school board had bought into this notion that if we just keep expelling kids and we're going to send a message to the teachers that we're supporting them by expelling more and more kids. So one of my first challenges was um, trying to convince the board that as I told them and I've said before, you can't ex expel your way to safer schools. You have to change the, change the environment. So we changed that and, and honestly, what really changed the school board was a few people went off the board and new people came on that were willing to, that were willing to look at things differently. So the school board was, a pol that political challenge was there in a large district. And then also I think with the teachers, um, the teachers, because of the way things had gone uh, in the past, were so focused on the discipline, the punishment side, the punitive side under the code of conduct that that's how they thought things should be handled. And if a principal or an assistant principal weren't, uh, if they weren't just hammering kids and getting rid of them, then they weren't doing their job. And so that we, I came into this situation where the teachers are feeling the principals weren't doing their jobs, the principals were killing themselves trying to make the places better and also uh, enforcing the, the code of conduct. Um, and yet the teachers still weren't feeling totally supported. So I think the key for, for our approach to, to change them was I realized I can't do a concentric circles here with these two huge high schools. It would take us 100 years to, to get to where we need to be. So uh, at the same time, get, um, talking with John Bailey and Ted Wachtell, and others at IARP about they were developing their new school, whole school reform model. And it took me, took a little convincing for me that I could go away from my concentric circles model that had worked <laughs> so well to do a whole school model. But uh, I have faith uh, and, we, and we jumped to um, training both high schools, um, faculties uh, and administration and, and adopting the whole school model at the same time at both of our, both of our large high schools. Um, this was not a grassroots effort. This was a top-down. This was a new superintendent came in. The new superintendent uh, knew that restorative practices worked. And not only that, but the district was, it was yelling out in need for it based on their overemphasis on the code of conduct and the punitive, uh, punitive approach and the number of expulsions that, that we were having. So this, this was really, this is something we're doing. The administrators uh, bought, on, bought into it. And then we move to the to the teacher trainings. I think that um, for at for implementation at any level, uh, the key is first to have a vision of what you know. Why are we doing this? It's about relationships. It's about improving the culture. It's about improving perceptions of safety. It's about ultimately um, creating a better environment for students to learn and to perform. Um, so we need to to keep our focus on that vision and that it's shifting the vision from purely the punitive model. Now that's not to say, I mean, we still suspend kids, and I always say this because as Mike said, you know, first thing people's perceptions are you're going soft somehow um, on, on crime when you do something different. And so, I mean, I've never, and I, was a, I ran a pretty tight ship as a high school principal, you know, it was never about um, not holding kids accountable. I view this as in addition to, there's still a, con if you get into a fight, there's a consequence. But now you have to do something to fix it. There's got to be that restorative piece and the fixing piece. So I view it as we're, we're asking more of children uh, to accept their behavior and, and fix it. 
So we need to get the board on board. We need to set a larger vision. We needed to then uh, make sure the principals were on board. My experience as a principal was the, the, the principal has to, has to buy in. If the principal is wavering on it, forget it. It's not going to happen. Um, and so the principal leadership, and Harrison and Mike will talk about things that they've done. They have sent strong messages that this is what we're about now. Guess what? Things are different. This is what we're about. And there's been pushback. Um, and there's been discomfort. But they can't waver, and they haven't wavered, and they've done some things in some high-profile cases that maybe they'll mention that where they stuck to a restorative process with positive outcomes, where it would have been easier to just go back to the punitive, go back to the punitive uh, box. So the principals have to say this is non-negotiable. Um, we have to do it within the larger framework. In our district, we talk about our roadmap to educational excellence. You know, I had to mention it at least. At least once, we mentioned the roadmap publicly on a regular basis. Roadmap, I'm sorry, right, roadmap 2.0, we just revised it. Thank you. Um, but it provides a framework for us that everything we do has to fit in. So it wasn't restorative practices just for the sake of restorative practices over here. In our roadmap, we talk about core learning, stretch learning, student engagement, and personal skill development, which is really values, character, and development. And so, what we're, restorative practices fits into our model for school improvement. It's not a standalone thing. I think that's important. It can't just be something we're doing just to improve discipline. That's not what it's about. It fits into the larger framework. And then I think that we had to, you know, take that, that look, as I mentioned before, of, of, you know, kind of rebooting the code of conduct then, and looking at it's not purely punitive. We want to be restorative as well. And for us, it's not so much we had to change our code of conduct, we had to take another look at the front half of the code of conduct where it talks about universal values and developing, and developing good citizens. So we've invested a fair amount of time in training teachers. Um, there have been, you know, we're, we're on the path. We're certainly not there, but we've seen uh, um, some good numbers on discipline statistics. We've seen some improvements on surveys that we've done, on perceptions. Um, and so we know we're moving in the right direction with the high schools don't change easily and they don't change quickly, but we're definitely moving in the right direction and seeing positive results. And I think uh, Harrison and Mike can talk with a little more detail about that. Good morning. Um, a lot has been said this morning that um, is already very, very similar. Um, and, uh, you know, you would think almost that doing something at the middle school level, um, you may see a lot different at the high school level. Um, and in actuality, in the way it was described, it's, it was very similar um, in my experience. Um, I, I started um, at, um, well, I was at Freedom High School um, when I began my public school career and then went to uh, Parkland School District, and I was at Parkland High School for about 11 years. And um, when I transitioned, um, well, during that time period, probably in about 2003, I believe, um, I was, um, I remember one day I was sitting at my desk, uh, and I was an assistant principal there, and I had stacks of referrals on my desk. Uh, and I, it was, I was drowning. Um, and I remember just kind of sitting back thinking, you know, th th there's got to be another way of dealing with this. Uh, and um, I got one of those, um, on the internet, one of those um, advertisements for um, restorative justice. Uh, and I said, what, what is that? Um, and so I kind of perused it a little bit and it said it was in Bethlehem, there was going to be an information session. and. Uh, and so um, at that point, I said, oh, hey, I'm, what I'm doing now isn't working, so um, let me check it out. And so I came and, and uh, ended up actually doing one of the trainings um, back in, in, in around 2000, 2003, somewhere in there. And, um, and it actually was, was really neat. Um, it was really a, a refreshing um, uh, viewpoint on how to work with students and families. And so um, I started to utilize some of those practices myself um, as an assistant principal um, in Parkland. Um, but 
um, you know, if you, you then kind of fast forward and I, and I um, uh, came to Bethlehem and uh, this is now my second year at Liberty High School as principal. And um, the thing that, you know, I recognized pretty quickly, um, you know, in, in, as, a, as a new principal, you need to assess your, your school, uh, both your students uh, and your faculty uh, and your families. And um, I realized very quickly that um, my faculty uh, was in need, um, in need of some relationship building, um, some improvements in communication. Um, and I knew that if we didn't do something uh, with the staff, uh, we were never going to see any gains with students. And so um, restorative practices had, had been uh, in place already a year before I got to uh, Bethlehem. And um, we really, at that point, um, focused on the staff and, and improving the relationships, some of the relationships that existed that were kind of poisoning the faculty. Uh, and um, what I did pretty quickly was, um, at, at one of our first couple of faculty meetings, I stated to the faculty, listen, um, you know, we're, we're a restorative high school. This is what we're saying we believe in, and this is what we're saying we are. Uh, and um, unfortunately, that's not necessarily for everyone. That's okay. If it's not for you, I, I understand, I respect you. Uh, I, you just can't work here. I, I'm okay with that. You tried to send them over to freedom. But they weren't welcome either. And, you know, I, I have to tell you, I mean, you know, once the, the, the faculty knew that I was taking that stand and that's what we were going to do, um, you know, they, they started to get on board. Um, and, and obviously there were some who, who jumped on board and there were some who had to be pushed. Um, but, um, but, but it happened. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we, we got to a point where, um, you know, we really transformed the school. Um, if you come into Liberty High School, in many of our conference rooms, you know, especially in my conference room, I got rid of my, my conference table. I pushed it all the way to the wall. Um, and, and all of my meetings with my administrative team, um, any of my informal hearings with, with parents and, and, and students, um, any of my um, major meetings, whether it be uh, for emergency management or any of those, all of those occur in circles um, without tables. Um, and it's more the kind of the, the symbolic component of it at this point um, to just drive home. And for me, it's important that when faculty, you know, there's, there's windows on our conference room um, from when you walk inside my office and you can see, what, if you're coming in to talk to my secretary, you can see into the conference room. And so I wanted anyone who came into that office, when they, when they looked in and saw us meeting in that room, they saw us sitting in a circle with nothing in between us. Um, I wanted that to be a very clear message um, that that's, that's the way we conduct business. Um, and, and I think you know, that and a number of other, th other things really set a tone um, with our faculty. And so that was a, a, um, one of the things that we did. Um, to to kind of talk a little bit about the, the, the impl implementation phase of things um, and, and things that we're, we're currently doing. Um, while we noticed that the first year um, there was a lot of pushback from the staff in terms of um, they would have, we had what was called PLGs, right, uh, personal, um, professional learning groups um, that occurred um, once a month for um, between 2.30 and 3.50. So that time period was sacred and, and they met in these professional learning groups um, and really focused on, uh, the first year, really focused on um, the concepts within restorative practices. So really looking at um, you know, effective statements and those kinds of things. Um, and although that was necessary and needed so that they could start to understand what it's all about, one of the issues that I, I saw when I, when I started a year in was that um, it still was very impersonal to them. Um, they didn't feel that it really applied to them in a, in a connecting um, in a type of way. And so what we did this year was we really, well, th this past year, was we really focused on um, looking at the topics of our professional learning groups 
and really focusing on issues that existed within our building. So we, we actually, those professional learning groups focused on communication between staff members. You know, what, is professional, what should professionalism look like? Um, you know, what, what is our mission? And what, should we, what should we be doing? Um, how, you know, how do we improve um, how students communicate to each other, um, both in the hallways and in our classrooms? And so we utilized each of those meetings e um, each month to really focus on our problems um, and come up with solutions. Um, well, what that did simultaneously, um, not, not only did it create a, uh, an environment to have conversation, productive conversation, but it also created buy-in. Um, it also helped teachers to feel that they were part of the solutions. Um, and that was absolutely critical. Uh, one of the things that had occurred for a long time at Liberty was this feeling of um, things are being done to us um, and we have no control over the production of our school and, and what direction we go in. And so um, I would, we would collect the, um, the, the, I guess the, the, the suggestions that teachers were making in these PLGs um, and we eventually started to implement some of those suggestions. Um, and so this process um, uh, really started to create that connection um, and that belief in um, that, that we control our destiny as a, as a faculty and as a school. Um, and so that, that, that's been an ongoing process. It still continues, um, but it's but yielded some very positive results. Um, on the flip side, with our students, um, one thing that we recognized was we, we've done a lot of work with our faculty in educating our faculty, um, in helping them understand restorative practices and, 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 um, and getting them to believe in, the, in that process. And we required them to run circles. Um, and we, there were scheduled circles um, in each um, department. Uh, and um, what we realized very quickly was that our faculty understood restorative practices, but our students really didn't get it. Um, they, they went through the process, they know the terms, but, but they weren't internalizing it. And so what we did um, this past summer was we, and, and towards the end of the school year and into the summer, was we worked with John Bailey um, in creating, um, and, and basically taking the work of restorative practices and circles and, and that whole world and infusing it into our health classes. And so now we actually are teaching our, our ninth and 10th graders um, what restorative practices is as part of the health curriculum. Um, and doing it from the standpoint of what are, what are healthy relationships and how do we communicate and how should we communicate um, and using restorative practices as a backdrop to have that, com that conversation. Uh, and so what, what the, the, the plan is, is to see that you know, as we actually teach them these tools versus just you know, expecting them to kind of absorb it, um, that we'll have much more productive students on the other end. Um, and so um, that um, is, is a work in progress, um, but um, as of right now, it's been developed, it's going well, um, and, and we're real happy with the process. And so, um, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Laporta, and I'm the principal of Freedom High School in Bethlehem. Um, I've been there for seven years now. And three years ago, when Dr. Roy came on board to Bethlehem, some of the undertone in the building was, I wonder if he's going to bring restorative practices with him. And as this began to uh, roll out in our building, and even before uh, we, we started the full-fledged uh, school change. Uh, I, I posed a question to our faculty, and I asked them to define insanity to me. And the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, uh, expecting a different result. And so that was the nexus to uh, rolling out uh, restorative practices at, at Freedom High School. And I'd like to talk about, turn that into two success stories. Um, 
first, the first success story really uh, leads into a tipping point or, or uh, that, that defining moment in our school. And, and the, the first success story really is uh, the cultural shift that exists, that, that, that has occurred in our building. Uh, a cultural shift of uh, uh, communication, a, a cultural shift involving uh, a, a true establishment of trust uh, among uh, our, our school community. The whole notion of freedom family exists. Um, our, our teachers, the administration, uh, our students, our parents, there's, there's just this whole open line of communication that exists through being a, a restorative high school. Uh, we, we attack problems as opportunities. Uh, the glass is always half, half full rather than half empty. Uh, we communicate with our parent organization. We communicate with our student organizations. Um, we have a school improvement team that addresses the issues. Um, so with that, with that being said, you know, there, there was the defining moment, as, as I can say. Um, we were a year into restorative practices at, at Freedom. And we did the whole circle thing. We did PLGs. They weren't working as well as we would have liked them to. But it was the end of the school year. And we had an incident of vandalism in our, in our school. And it was about a week and a half before graduation. And we had uh, four seniors sneak into our school about 11 o'clock at night. And it's uh, nearing the end of a, of a custodial shift change. And they realized that in our fountain area, uh, there was uh, vandalism done, significant vandalism, more of a mess rather than uh, breaking things. And we were able to clean it up before the start of school the next day. And people found out. And they were looking to see how I would handle it. Was I going to be punitive in nature? Was I going to disallow these students to not participate in our commencement ceremony? And, and uh, what I did is we, we handled it restoratively. Uh, we ran a restorative conference. The people that were invited to the conference were the students who obviously uh, created the vandalism. They were invited to have one support person other than a parent to be part of the conference. Their parents were invited. Uh, I invited also the victims. The victims were uh, the custodial staff, uh, the assistant principals, the counselors, teachers who were directly connected to the students, coaches, advisors were invited. And then I invited about four or five naysayers, people who I didn't think were on board yet. And they sat in this restorative conference. It, it was huge. It went about three hours in length. And the emotion and how this conference culminated itself was that this was an amazing process. And there were criteria in the restorative agreement that we needed, that students needed to complete. There was community service for the school. There was a school-wide apology to their senior class members at graduation rehearsal. There was apologies that needed to be made to the faculty at a faculty meeting. And there was a lot of ownership that needed to take place. Uh, all of those criteria were met. That was the tipping point. That was, that was the defining moment of restorative practices at Freedom High School. The second success story that evolves out of this is the data. We have seen amazing data evolve out of, out of uh, the beginning of our restorative practices uh, initiative. We've seen tremendous, tremendous reduction probably close to 200% reduction uh, of code of conduct referrals. We've seen a significant reduction in student consequences of suspension, expulsion, student arrests. Now, to create the framework or the mindset of what Freedom High School looks like, we're in a suburban setting, but we are an urban school. Close to 40% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. 
they're, identi that's, uh, they're identified as being economically disadvantaged. Um, there's a, a direct connect to, to our, our student achievement levels and some of our code of conduct uh, data to the economics uh, found within our school. So those are some of the issues that, that the data allows us to attack. Dr. Roy mentioned earlier, uh, we, we, we survey our, our students. We have a school improvement survey. Over the three years of, of administering this survey, we've seen approximately a, a 9% reduction in school safety, whereas in year one implementation of restorative practices uh, to year three, of the survey, we've seen 9% of our student population feels more safe in school. So those are really the, the, the two success stories. I, I talk about how do we tackle our challenges within our school. Uh, we circle up. We have a school improvement team. Uh, it operates uh, in circle format. There's a check-in every meeting. Uh, we, it it, it kind of looks like a fishbowl at, at, at times. Uh, where if somebody has a particular issue that they want to address, then they go in the center and we address it in, in fishbowl format. Um, if nobody has a particular uh, item of concern, then we attack school improvement issues, uh, uh, student achievement, uh, the PLG process. The PLG process that we, we implemented doesn't look the same as it did in year one. Uh, year one, teachers were looking for me and, and my assistant principal who was facilitating uh, PLGs to come up with the topics of discussion. And the, the true PLG really, that individual group, we have many PLGs that operate in our school. Each PLG perhaps has a different issue that they need to address. So the, the PLG leader facilitates uh, identifying the topics of PLG and if there's no issues going on in school then let's take one of the components of restorative practices whether it's affective statements or whether it's the social discipline window and let's talk about in our PLG uh, how well we are working within the framework of being a restorative high school you know are we implementing restorative practices with fidelity in our school. Those are the topics of conversation uh, that occur in, in our PLGs. An important piece also is the whole professional development piece. We have, we, we're a large school. We have about 116 teachers. Harrison probably has close to 200 teachers in his building. And, and so with that, there's always turnover. This past summer, we became trainers ourselves uh, to be able to train our new teachers coming into our, into our building as well as make ourselves available to the institute if, if they need trainers to go out somewhere. And, and that was really beneficial to us because you know, now we're able to uh, present restorative practices to our faculty from a, you know, a, a, training, a training framework. Um, Dr. Roy mentioned earlier the, the roadmap. I had to get it in. Nicely done. All right. Um, <laughs> I noted Harrison didn't in his remarks. <laughs> However, you did have roadmap 2.0, so that was good. I think one of the, the, the most important pieces out of, out of restorative practices to our roadmap is the whole personal skill development, teaching our students how to handle their business the right way, leaving the drama out of it, you know, if you have an issue with somebody, whether it's an issue with a teacher, whether it's an issue with an assistant principal or, or a, a student, we, we, handle, we handle our issues differently. We handle them from a restorative frame of mind. We confront it without confronting it immaturely. And, and that's how we, we present this at, at our opening of school. It's part of my remarks. Uh, it's part of the assistant principal's piece when, you know, we do have to talk about that code of conduct, uh, but we address the code of conduct restoratively rather than, than, than punitively. We are educational institutions. We're not prisons. We're not punitive institutions. So we have to teach our students how to handle your business the right way because those are the skills that take them 
out into the world beyond Freedom High School. It takes them into the world of college. It takes them into the world of work. And in, in business and industry and colleges today, they're looking for problem solvers. They're looking for people who are able to work as part of teams. And, and the whole restorative piece is kind of that helping them become productive in, in their pathway of, of wherever they're going to be going. Um, I, I think the, the gaps that, that, that exist, obviously, as I said a moment ago, is, is the whole turnover piece and making sure that we keep our, staff, our new staff, we, we teach them uh, as soon as they come on board. We talk restoratively in, in our teacher induction meetings. We talk about, that's our theme tonight. Uh, I have three of my assistant principals talking about code of conduct, restorative practices, and public relations. Uh, because the restorative practices piece in our building has become a public relations tool for me and, and, and for our school. And our new staff needs to be part of that and, and uh, keep them up to, up to par. The other piece, too, is the maintenance piece. Our faculty meetings, uh, we talk about restorative practices because it, it can become out of sight, out of mind. It becomes, uh, you know, it's, it's part of what we do every day. But if you don't talk about it, sometimes it's easy almost to forget about it. Uh, and, and so we have to intentionally talk, use the words restorative practices. And, uh, you know, just for, uh, for instance, uh, this past Friday, uh, I was doing some thinking about today. And I asked my daughter, who's an 11th grader at, at Freedom, you know, have you, have you circled up lately in, in class? That's a neat thing about being the principal of the school your children go to. You can, you know, do some neat things. And, and uh, she says, oh, my God, Dad, we circled up in Mrs. Jolly's class today, and we had some drama. And so, you know, not getting into the details of the drama, uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, it was right there. And, and, you know, there was an issue in, in her one class, and the teacher felt comfortable enough in, in circling up and, and addressing the issue rather than uh, making it the responsibility of my assistant principal or, or a guidance counselor. So from the big picture of, of things, we, we've seen a complete cultural change at Freedom High School and, and in, our, in our high schools. And it's a good thing because we're eliminating the insanity that was once there of doing the same thing and suspending and expelling and arresting students. Uh, it's, it's decreased itself significantly. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Susan Boshin, and I am also a very proud principal of Lewis E. Dariff High School in Allentown. We have about 1,950 students. We're on the east side, one of two high schools in Allentown, of course. Uh, we are 85% free and reduced lunch. We are a full Title I school, uh, very diverse. Uh, about 60% of our students are, 65% are Hispanic, uh, about 12% black, and then um, uh, the rest being white, uh, some Native American, and some Asian. Now, I am still riding this uh, learning curve of restorative practices. We are in year two. Um, I'm in my fourth year as the head principal at Dariff High School. And I want to thank my compatriots up here because I'm, all, I'm still writing down some ideas and, mm -hmm. and notes and um, some inspiration. So I want to thank uh, my colleagues up here as well. I'm just going to share with you uh, a few highlights of our story of implementation. Um, and I want to make sure I don't forget anything. And I, I have to say so many of the, the pieces that uh, my fellow principals up here shared, we've experienced the same thing. Um, taking on restorative practices was a pretty huge undertaking for our two high schools. Uh, we had created those beautiful charts of school-wide 
positive behavior, behavior models, beautiful charts of what we expect students to do in the hallway, in the cafeteria, um, and we posted them all over the school. And things just weren't working as well as we had hoped. <laughs> And we kept saying, well, this is how you're supposed to behave. But we really needed some tools and strategies of how to get everyone there, you know, how to travel to that end goal. And a lot of our teachers are, you know, education is a small world. We travel in the same circles. A lot of our teachers are friends with Bethlehem teachers, and they had heard about this, restorative practices. Well, Bethlehem's doing restorative practices. And um, our central office, got wind of it and we started looking into it and there were meetings and uh, lo and behold the two high schools were taking it on full gusto all teachers you know it's what Allentown loves to do two feet plunging into the deep end <laughs> so off we went and we started with some full staff trainings uh, at the beginning of last year so our first year was the 2012 2013 school year and I think restorative practices sent out an army of trainers, you know, to train Allen and Dareff high schools. And they mixed us up and we strategically placed, you know, certain teachers in groups. And um, we brought in our alternative schools, which added this dynamite stick, you know, to our groups. And I really have to hand it to the restorative practices trainers because they had their hands full and they did a marvelous job. And I have to tell you too that our staff at Dareff High School, they were hungry. Like, I have to explain it, they wanted to learn some strategies and skills to get to those end goals on our school-wide positive behavior model, these beautiful posters we had everywhere. They really wanted it. And without them, this never would have worked so beautifully this year. Our, I have to commend our staff because our teacher leaders were key. They were absolutely key. In our PLGs, and it goes through, and every school leader knows this, for PLCs or PLGs or whatever small collaborative group of teachers you have, you have to have a designated leader. You have to have someone in charge. And it's a great opportunity for building capacity within your teachers as well. Because then there's that accountability piece. And we had, fortunately, we had this beautiful schedule last year. We don't have it this year, but last year we had embedded teacher collaboration time for PLCs. And then what we did was we created PLGs to run out of those groups. We lost that this year in our reprogramming. And um, we are looking for alternative ways to get teachers back together, and I think we found some. So our teacher leaders were. Uh, Working with our rep, I can't say enough about Mary Jo Hebling. She's been at our beck and call. Thank you, Mary Jo. It was persistent pressure with our teacher leaders, working with our teachers. Uh, the circles, we too have students that say, uh, we need a circle, miss. We need a circle, let's circle up. And we work very hard on turning those circles into learning the second semester. Um, what we found with restorative practices is it, it truly humanizes every person in that school building. Metacognitively, we talk about our likes, our dislikes, our humor. And you're no longer this student who was just disrespectful to me. You are someone's son, someone's brother. You enjoy watching this TV show. That little restorative check-in which can be fun, it's very powerful. We model it at our team leader meetings, our department chair meetings, when we have guests in, even in a whole group like this, when I have a faculty meeting of our 200 teachers, I shouldn't say that, uh, 130, Alan is 200. But with our support staff, with security guards, it's about 200 folks in the room. I make them find, I say, at the very beginning of every meeting, make eye contact with, with your restorative check-in partner right now and answer this question. At our last faculty meeting, I said, if you had only $20 to your name, what would you spend it on? <laughs> they loved it. And that little trigger sets the mood for any meeting. You are human once again. We have similarities. We have 
uh, differences, but together we're all one. So I can't say enough about that. Then we moved into go-arounds for brainstorming at our meetings, and um, we would constantly ask teachers, are you using these? Here's how to do it. We're modeling it. Are you using these with your students? Um, we even used a restorative conference with two co-teachers in a classroom who weren't getting along so swimmingly. And let me tell you, that traveled through the grapevine of the school within 10 seconds. Do you? Do you know they used restorative practices with two teachers who weren't getting along? And um, I don't think anybody wanted to be in the next set that got called in for that. Uh, but I didn't run it. Uh, we have a teacher, we have two teachers now, who are in the graduate program here at Restorative Practices. And um, we asked her to run it. And she's highly respected. Oh, lovely young teacher, only in her third year. But she's highly respected because she employs these questions and strategies, and she's these excellent relationships with students. So she ran it, and uh, it worked out beautifully. Also, um, our challenge is making time for that restorative conference with our teacher and a student who may have had a, a tough incident that has compromised their relationship. Um, how, how often does a student go into an in-school suspension room and all of a sudden they're re-entered into the classroom and there hasn't been that connection between the teacher and the student. So we are trying to find ways to reconnect and have that conference with maybe our, our in-school suspension room isn't called that anymore. It's called alternative to suspension, an ATS room. And we have a huge component of restorative practices in that room. And we ask teachers to stop down and have that conversation with the help of one of the teachers. and so that when that student re-enters, it's not just a cold um, re-entry. You know, there's a soft landing. You've made a connection. I've heard you, you've heard me. This is where we need to meet in the middle, and these are the non-negotiables, and this is how I will restore our relationship so that we can carry out our primary mission of learning, student learning. You can't learn in an environment in which you don't feel trusted or safe. And restorative practices has really helped us transform our culture. We're working very hard at embedding it into our organizational school culture. Let me tell you at the end of the day um, what was happening by the end of the year. We started implementing some interventions that we've learned through restorative practices that weren't just punitive. And we tried to amp up those numbers, such as reflection journaling with the assistant principal or the dean. That increased as an intervention last year from 2012 to 2013 by 84%. Reflection journaling. Goal setting, either with a counselor or with an assistant principal or a dean or even an ATS teacher, we increased that from 2012 to 2013 by 65% with students who had been referred for behaviors. Now here's the big win. From 2012 to 2013, our tardies to school. It was a big issue for us, getting kids to school on time and feeling as though it's the place you want to be, to value, to make a difference in your future. We had a 45% reduction in lates to school. But here's the big win. From 2012 to 2013, our out of school suspensions dropped from 1,432 to 216, an 85% reduction in out-of-school suspensions. Because an out-of-school suspension, thank you. We know an out-of-school suspension helps no one. It's a disconnect, it's a breakaway. You don't mean anything to us, get out. It's not the message we wanted to send to our students. So, that's our story. We are riding a learning curve. We're in year two. We have another full day training coming up. Mary Jo is working with us. She meets with our leadership team. She comes in and um, we're finding it a challenge to keep it moving, keep the momentum going, but that gentle, persistent pressure. Teacher leaders are key and I can't say enough about our staff. Um, they've really stepped up to this. And so that's our story still in progress. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was.
as I said, this is the first year we've done this format, and I love it. I don't think we're going to change from. It's nice to have a series of perspectives. We used to do longer speeches, and now is the part. The other part of the change is, come on up and say something. Sorry, Ted. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually an educator by profession from the UK, but I live in Silver City and uh, last year I was invo involved in doing some circles with um, women who are incarcerated um, in our local county detention centre. And they were just talking circles, they, they didn't involve victims, but um, there's one woman who um, I was thinking about during your presentations and she said uh, when she got there she felt uh, not only suicidal but homicidal but after the circles that had changed because of the connection she felt and um, as you were talking I just found myself <laughs> thinking like how many tragedies have you prevented you know Sandy Hook Columbine and we're never gonna know you know the news broadcasts all these tragedies but how many um, have been prevented from your work so I just want to give you kudos for that. This is my 16th conference, and uh, as I listen, I think, uh, wow, um, fantastic. Uh, a few years ago, I was in Canada working in York School Board, and I actually uh, was to run a one-day training with a group of 200 and odd uh, specialist teachers. And um, the superintendent said to me, uh, Terry, before we start, um, I actually want you to, in fact, I've been asked this lots of times, what, how does uh, restorative practice compare with a myriad of other programs? And I had character education, mind matters, tribes, and glasses. And I said, oh, sorry, I'm really confused. She said, what are you confused about? I said, I actually thought you were educators. She said, well, we are. I said, what do you benchmark quality teaching and learning against? What programs? And she said, no. I said, for example, in New South Wales, we have a quality teaching framework, which is about sound pedagogy. What I'd like to see is the next generation sitting up here talking about restorative practices, the integral part of teaching and learning. So we move from thinking in terms of behavioural responses to relationships as a foundation in which good teaching and learning takes place. The question I ask, why is there that disconnect? What I've listened to is extraordinary. But what I've listened to is the acknowledgement that what we're doing isn't working. What we actually have to do is to work out why it isn't working before we even entertain the idea of restorative practice. Now, as a simple little exercise with groups of teachers, I give them a, a simple one-page questionnaire which asks them to describe what they would see happening in an ideal classroom that would create the conditions in which optimum learning would take place where students would be, become self-directed learners, where they would be responsible for the maintenance of the classroom. They go through that exercise, then I give them the pedagogy document, which is a really simple document. I say, now, answer the same questions again after you've read that document. And it's a completely different answer. And I say to them, today, I'm gonna to take you on a journey. And I actually want you to identify how you think restorative practice resonates with quality teaching. Frankly, my criticism of learning institutions is they teach pedagogy, but they use terrible pedagogy to do so. <laughs> now, this isn't directed at educators. This is universal in terms of all professions. We actually have to work out where we're at. And the theme here, fantastic. 
what works, what doesn't, how and why. We'll never embrace this as an integral part of how we build relationships until we ask the right questions. Thanks for your inspiration. Thank you, um, Denise Zakaiza Skyza. My name is Bonnie George, and I'm from Northwest BC. And there was a few of you that heard my uh, my presentation yesterday, and I want to put my hands up to you guys for implementing this in the school. We've done so 25 years ago. We've taken we've taken control of our education system in my community. Um, we're a certified high school. We're a certified adult center. We're a certified elementary school, and it's all run by First Nations people. And since we've implemented our culture and tradition practices in within the curriculum, because the curriculum prior to that was trying to fit a circle into a square. And we were only setting our people up for failure. And since we've taken control, and since we've been implementing culture and tradition, we have so many success stories. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have teachers, we have uh, um, our own people that have master's degrees in whatever area you can cover. And I have a 23-year-old cousin who is uh, practicing medicine in Calgary, Alberta today. Um, thankfully for you know restorative practices. It's not only in our schools, it's a part of our life. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, I have a question for all of you. I teach at a large local high school where we have 180 staff. And um, I, when I was trained in restorative practices at my school, we had the training and then we had basically like a PLG for six weeks where we sort of continued the conversation. Um, now we are training a larger number of staff um, but that PLG piece is not in there. So what I want to know is how have you all done that? Has it been like sort of after school voluntary? I know you mentioned that it had been part of the time period, then it's not. Do you provide extra compensation? The practical, <laughs> practical aspect. Our PLGs are embedded in our, in our teacher schedules. Um, we have, we're on a, uh, a semester block schedule and our teachers teach three out of the four blocks in the day. They have a 45 minute planning period uh, as well as an as assigned period where they may have a duty, they could have a calf duty, they could have a hall duty, they could uh, provide a coverage for a, a colleague. One day a week is assigned to PLG. I have an assistant principal who creates a PLG schedule. Okay. Uh, they are interdisciplinary in nature. They're all different subject area teachers uh, that, that meet in, in their PLG and address building issues uh, or issues I'm having a difficult time with this particular student or, you know, it, 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 could, it, it varies significantly. But it, it is it's an expectation uh, one day a week uh, for, for all teachers in our building. And part of my administrative team meeting, uh, we do have a PLG component, a part of our meeting okay, with uh, a check-in and problem-solving session. One, one of the things that um, helps at Liberty is that um, in the same stance that we, we have every Monday after school is carved out for something. After, um, and what we've done is we've shortened my faculty meetings are only 20 minutes. Okay. Um, if, I can't, if I can't say it in 20 minutes, I mean, we have a problem. So my faculty meetings are 20 minutes long, but that time is now put into PLGs. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and so we, we make that a priority, okay. um, which I think sets, sets the agenda that, you know, that's what we're, we're About, focused on. Yeah. So. That's good. Yeah. Here's one other idea. Just, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to mention the framework of if anyone's coming up, we're, we're going to finish in a few minutes. So one more speaker. I can't ask anyone else to come up, but thank you. I can share with you what we've just uh, decided to create. As uh, Mike said, teachers have a duty because it helps to run a safe school, you know, hall duty or 
calf duty, you have to have a, a safe school with teacher supervision. What we've done is we've created a schedule for substitutes that cover duties, uh, duty sub, and then we can maybe swap a teacher's prep period with a duty and get them together, because teachers really don't like being pulled out of their assigned classroom, obviously. And right, right. um, we don't want to pull them out of that. Um, but if we can hire a couple subs that are willing to do duties, then with the occasional pull, if it doesn't work out on the schedule, the occasional pull of a teacher from a class, but we really try to avoid that. Good morning. I'm uh, Gregor Ray from uh, Aberdeen in Scotland. And um, for about 30 years, um, I've worked with uh, large organizations, uh, not-for-profits, education, uh, corporates, uh, around major change. And the challenge for the leadership, and by the way, what I heard is inspirational. What you're doing is absolutely marvelous. And it's just an observation. Um, when you are driving major changes in organizations and the implementation of restorative practice surely is a fundamental and profound change, that the, um, the tendency is to look within your own organization and drive change within the organization. And what we tend not to do is to look beyond the walls of our organizations and look beyond into the wider ecosystem that we're part of and say, what else can we leverage to help us on our journey? Because it's all about sustainability and I think the restorative message goes beyond the, the boundaries of any organization and it's surely a methodology to reach out and engage with others other stakeholders and whatever it is you're doing to help you sustain the change that you're you're trying to do and so for example in the United Kingdom in a very very simple way our work with schools both primary and secondary schools is to help the leadership of the schools look beyond their own boundaries and reach out into the near areas of the ecosystem and by that we mean parents and families, the wider family and how they can help the organization to sustain what it is it's, it's trying to do. And I believe the restorative ethos, the restorative message is hugely conducive to that ability to reach out beyond your own boundaries into that wider ecosystem and help build sustainability. Thank you very much.